If you're not a history specialist, you may find the demands of your core subjects leaves you wondering how best to use history effectively. We're going to be going back in time in our time machine. We're going to be thinking about things that happened in the past. Kate Gooding is a teacher who featured in the primary history programme Time and Place, where she worked with Gail Richards from School Theatre Company to combine a local site visit with role play to introduce the notion of chronology. Her lesson demonstrates some of the ways history can contribute to learning across the curriculum. Today she is joined by Elizabeth Watson, a primary AST and humanities coordinator, Rebecca Marshall, a Year 6 teacher, as well as Grant Bage and Hilary Clare from the Historical Association Primary Committee. Together they watch Kate's lesson and use it to discuss some of the ways history can help in areas like crossing core subjects, inclusivity and skills-based learning. This is the beginning. This is now. What time phrase is going to come first? Big loud voice. Yesterday, Rachel told us we learned about the time. Excellent. Well done. Who's the day was really about looking at time. Also, I was very interested in finding out, well, how much do they know about chronology and how much do they what sort of knowledge do they have already? It's very important for small children to know where they're coming from, well, all children, to know where they're coming from um, in order to, have a, to know where their starting point is to where they're going. And using a local building, which we'd done it within geography, which was the church, but hadn't thought about the history of it or how long it had been there. Today, we are all going to act as private investigators. <gasps> I suppose really, really that, that sort of idea of starting with an area like this which has changed so much you know over the years mm. so if you can look at the now it's a really good way of then getting into well what was it like last year what was it like it a few it years ago for them because it's yeah. got to be relevant and otherwise it's just too abstract for them isn't it it's just got to fit in with their lives Whoa. Whoa. look at these seats it's really interesting how you can revisit the same mm. sort of places that you've, you know, you might have been to them before, but if you go with a different sort of set of spectacles on through the historian's eyes. eyes, then you just look at it in a whole different way. And that, that idea of sort of trying to build up from the clues of the past something more about why this building's here and how people used it and who was in there. This is a really clever one. Oh yes, what clues can you see? Um, she's the unicorn, he's the lion. Where have you seen them before in the church? The Up there? In some of the role plays, it reminded me of some work I'd done also with Year 3. We recreated those poses, but before they did that, they'd done quite a lot of research and reading about the actual period. So it, it kind of, the, the, the animation and the role play came after the research mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. as the next stage. And I think it's just a possible strategy. There are different mm -hmm. ways of approaching things, aren't there? Oh, and there's a clue over there. Jesus. I don't know. Who do we think it is? What does he look like? King. Does he look like a king? What tells us that he's a king? What clues are there? He's got there? long hair. He's got very long hair, doesn't he? Looks he looks like King Charles. Does he look like King Charles? So, when it comes to skills-based learning, what does history have to offer? Through the day, other skills we were trying to develop, obviously, language skills. Um, there are all the children are EAL. And I think through working on history projects like this, you can develop an awful lot of different different skills that mm. can relate to other areas. I think, the, think just things like the investigative skills to start with, you mm. know, well, and the questioning. You know, how do we ask questions? You know, well, who was that person? Where did they come from? What did they do? Why did that happen? I mean, it's also just in a quite a, an everyday way. History is such a, such a fantastic reason to to read. You know, to write, to talk, to listen. Yeah, as you say, quite often, so the, the children that are reluctant to read or, or don't want to write actually gives them a reason to do so. And then you can start exploring the different ways of recording what they want to put down as well. Yeah. You know, So it really is a way in to get some of these children to start recording their work. To make a radio mm. show or something, so they're not writing, but mm. recording right. it in a different way. You yeah. can use that not just for history, but for all of the other sort of areas within the curriculum as well. If we go back to our roots and think about history as storytelling, then actually children can both co sort of consume that as listeners, but then it becomes their own and the language and the ideas and to the pass characters, on. they can start retelling it. What's in the photograph of? Children. They, yeah, that's in the old time again. That's in the olden times. But how do you know that, Sarah? What because, clues did you because, find? Because it's my black and white. It's black and white. 
And what are the ways that history can help with inclusion? We were thinking about what ordinary people would have been like 300 years ago, what it would have been like for them, rather than looking at kings and queens. So I suppose what I mean about inclusivity, it's, it's actually about seeing that the children in one's classroom need somebody and people that they can identify with and feel is, is interesting and important to them. What about, um, sometimes I feel like I get a bit stuck in a rut though, so I'm going, oh yes, here's the rich people, here's the poor people, mm. look at the rich, look at the poor. I always, you know, I always just seem to do that quite a lot, so have you got any tips? Even if it's not linked into local history, it might be, well, let's think about what, supposing we were in a time capsule and people said we want to find out about the decade 2000 to 2010, what would we want to tell them about? What would we want them to know? Now, OK, let's take those same, same ideas and categories about the music people played and listened to, about the clothes they wore, what they did in their leisure time and so forth, and let's see if we can take that, say, into the, the 50s or the war period, the, the 40s, mm. and see what we can find out about within each of those different areas. And I think if you, if you go on what was popular, then you can sort of, in a sense, hit both ends and the yeah, middle. Really yeah, because it is a trap. I know just yeah. what you mean. You can, it's yeah. really, it's really easy to fall I think they don't think there's anything else. You were yeah. rich or you're poor, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, also about perspective nice. interpretation is that being the servant was not the same as being the person who was being waited on that's at the right. table. Um, being the boy in the family is not the same as being the girl in that mm. family and, and so forth. And I think that helps them to understand that actually history is much more sort of nuanced and mm. multifaceted than it's one story about this group of people or that mm -hmm. group of people. I think you can actually do a lot of history without mm. actually saying, well, we're just going to cover this particular area. You can actually take a completely different theme and see how a sport or an instrument or a type of instrument or music has actually developed and you can get a really good form of chronology that way mm. as well as you say just taking a one-off area. What would you say to your Ofsted inspector <laughs> if you did that in Key Stage 2 they'd say where does this fit? Uh, it can actually fit very very well indeed yeah. because also don't forget when you're looking at um, doing your history you're not just looking at learning facts and figures no, right. you're also looking at how you do it, how you learn. Mm. And if those children are learning about chronology, they're learning history, mm. then really you are doing what Ofsted wants. So if exactly. the children can apply their skills, then they have met the objectives because mm. that's what, you know, it's all about, um, yes. you know, using sources, applying that's knowledge. Right. What's it made out of? Um, metal. It is made out of metal. What do you think this was for? It's something not very nice. I know what it is, Miss. It's for your toilet. Absolutely, it's to go to the toilet in. And how is it that history can help across the whole curriculum? There is a lot of time pressure, you know, we're expected to, to focus mainly on the core subjects of English, maths and science. Um, and history is, is something that could get pushed to the side. Mm. I've always taken it the other way around, take my literacy from my history and made it really cross-curricular. Mm. I think what's really great about history is that it's a sort of this fascinating mixture of fiction and non-fiction in some senses, mm. because you, you've got to be imaginative to reconstruct history because it's not there, it's gone. And there's only these little fragments of bits of evidence around you. So you have to use your imagination to reconstruct that inside your inside your mind or on the classroom wall or in the bit of writing you're doing. It's it's so perfect for links with mm. with English and with literacy and, and with mm. information handling from any of the other areas too. It does actually encompass and you can include every single other subject. Yeah. Whatever area or era in history you're studying, you can go and learn the dances, you can actually go and play the music, you mm. can start to sing the songs. When you're doing something like long division in maths, if the child really, or children really can't understand or don't have the knowledge of their times table for whatever reason, they can't normally do the long division, they find it really hard, introduce the Egyptian method. Mm. Suddenly yeah. you've got a child that couldn't access long division, has now got method to do it. Mm. Use history if you want as a frame for the whole of the curriculum, because yeah. it's just that point, because people have always added up and people have always cooked and people have, you know, always tried to improve themselves through technology mm. and then people have always had faiths and stories and ideas and myths. So you can use it if you want as a frame. There's lots of like amazing ideas here and it all sounds wonderful, but for me, like my reality check is that I've got to get my children to pass the SATs. Um, my children have got English as a second language and I know you can do all these cross-curricular links, but I've really got to put so much effort into the three subjects of the SATs. I mean, the content of maths tends to be fairly clear and occasionally, depending on how 
good your own maths is, you're going to be able to use historical examples or work them backwards and forwards. Literacy hasn't got such a clear content. It's got a, it seems to me it's got a set of, of strategies mm-hmm. which children have to learn. And that it seems to me at that point that if you think, what's my other, my other foundation mm-hmm. subjects? How can I actually use them as the content? Because you've got to write about something, you've got to read about something, mm-hmm. you've got to talk about something. Mm-hmm. You've got to learn apostrophes about something, or whatever it is, haven't you? So in that sense, I think it's, it's that kind of pulling things together. If we've got a really stimulating um, um, lo- local history story, or we've got a, a fantastic bit of, 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 of non-fiction as a description of you know, um, an, an execution in Tudor times mm-hmm. or whatever it happens to be, then actually we can slot that in as appropriate, particularly in the literacy hour, but I mean also if we're thinking about assemblies and PSHE and, and mm-hmm. class activities, then we, you know, we can use bits of history in there. Okay, what we're going to start working on today, you're going to draw a picture from the day with some writing, okay, what you found out, but also talking about the jobs that people did. So, all in all, what can primary history do for you? What we've done is artificially say this is literacy time, this is maths mm. time, when actually we live in a world in which everything oh, fits together and, and because history is about it all our lives. Every, which is every nice, which is, you know, yeah. it's, it's moving on now. The primary curriculum is so much more about going back to how I was originally taught, in fact, mm. you know, mm. at the end of the 80s. It was all about linking ideas together mm. and connecting, mm. um, making cross-curricular links. And it's quite nice it's come full circle, oh, it's come exactly. back to that. Mm. I think children, because it's how children learn. Yeah, I was just mm. saying, mm. children find it much easier to learn as well if they see the connections. Mm. They, see, they don't, their minds don't work in seeing subjects split up. No, There's no, no rhyme nor reason for it. But if you actually do put whole thing together mm. as one whole and they can see these can links. There's history as stuff about the past and there's, yeah. the, there's the sort of historical thinking yeah. and weaving those together is very important and I think the national curriculum for all of its faults has done quite a lot to, to, to help us get manageable you know bits, lumps yeah. of history that yeah. you can actually get the thinking in as well as the mm. information, the, mm. the stuff and they are still pretty manageable, I mean you can do an awful lot of cross-curricular work. Yeah. Yeah. What, what the national curriculum has helped us I think is to understand what the concepts of history itself yeah. are, so that when we plan we don't kind of lose mm. and just because you're learning about the past that somehow you're not doing something about change and interpretation of evidence oh. and so forth, that, which has to, it has to still be there, doesn't it? Because mm-hmm. otherwise it's not history anymore, it's just a set of little stories, which are, which mm-hmm. are great fun. And the final question is, where do you go from here? Start with what's in the QCA, look at the kind of the model that it, it provides, and then go, go further, develop your own confidence, because we have been given permission. Mm-hmm. We've been given permission from the top, In fact, we're being urged all the time from the top now to get more creative and more, uh, to feel that we should have the courage now to to be creative. If you look at the front of the outcomes, the learning outcomes, if you use those as your starting point of what you actually want the children to achieve, what you want them to get out of it, then you can be as creative as you want, really, how you actually go about it. You know, the, the local environment's full of history wherever we are. And if you're not sure about how to interpret it, then your local history society or your local record office will will have you know, things that you can do and bits of evidence you can mm. put in front of children and ideas. And just think what your children in your class need, because yeah. each class is different. Because you know them best, mm. don't you? And I think that also comes back to our expectations. We think, oh, year three can't cope with this, or year four, but they can. Absolutely. And I think we have to expect that they can, they can do it. If we give them the right scaffolding motivation, mm. you know, they will do it, they will take it a long, long way. For more details of how you can use history across the curriculum, go to www.teachers.tv.